So in this video, we're going to start getting a, a little bit more technical, a little bit more formal. Uh, we're going to be building up to start discussing consensus protocols in earnest uh, next lecture, in lecture two. So first of all, you know, what do we even mean by consensus? So that's actually a, a subtle question, uh, and we'll have to be careful about it. But let me just tell you what I mean just very informally by consensus. So consensus is, is roughly going to mean keeping a bunch of machines in sync. And in this context, machines are often referred to as nodes. And I encourage you to think of these nodes as just machines that are scattered all over the globe, communicating with each other you know, over the internet. So two things are going to make you know, consensus quite non-trivial to achieve. Uh, so first of all, there's a, a certain unreliability of a communication network like the internet. Right? You're going to have unexpected network delays, network outages, you know, maybe even sort of malicious attacks like denial of service attacks. And then the second thing uh, that makes consensus hard is we don't want to assume that every node is correctly running uh, the intended protocol. So maybe some nodes have sort of an out of date or buggy version of the protocol. Maybe some nodes are actually even controlled by a malicious actor who's trying to subvert the protocol. So we want to keep these machines all over the globe in sync, despite the fact uh, that you might have network unreliability and you might even have malicious attacks. So here's the plan over these lectures for understanding the consensus problem. We're going to start at the beginning of lecture number two. We're going to pile on so many assumptions that it will become clear how to achieve consensus. We'll almost sort of trivialize the problem. Then as we go on, future lectures beyond lecture two, we'll start relaxing those assumptions one by one, thereby getting more and more realistic uh, versions of the consensus problem, uh, requiring more and more ideas to actually achieve consensus. There will, however, be two assumptions that we never relax, two permanent assumptions that will just stand throughout the entire lecture series, both of which happily, you know, are, are, are quite easy to stomach. So first of all, you know, as I was saying, when we were talking about layer zero in the blockchain stack, we're going to, uh, we're going to take as given that the internet exists. Okay, the two untrusted parties can communicate with each other as long as they know each other's IP address. You know, we're not going to assume the internet's perfect. There's going to be delays, outages, possible DOS attacks but we will assume we can build on top of the internet. The second thing we're going to assume, and which we'll drill down on on the rest of this slide, is we're going to assume that we can use cryptography. So cryptography, obviously it's a huge field. There's tons and tons of cryptographic tools that have been implemented. There's even more that have been at least constructed uh, in theory. The good news is, you know, in these lectures, we're gonna need kind of the bare minimum of tools from cryptography. So for the most part, we're going to need only two things. Uh, first of all, we're going to need the existence of cryptographic hash functions. That's something we won't talk about in this lecture, but we'll talk about it at length later, especially in the context of proof of work. Uh, and then the thing which we will talk about right now, we will assume the existence of digital signature scheme. So what do I mean by a digital signature scheme? Well, intuitively, it's just like it sounds, right? We all know what it means to sort of sign, you know, a document sort of in real life, you know, with pen and paper. Uh, so we just want some, you know, analogous way to add your signature uh, to documents that are digital. Now, formally, the way we uh, define a digital signature scheme is through three algorithms, a key generation algorithm, a signing algorithm, and a verification algorithm. So let me say a little bit about each of those three algorithms in a little more detail. So the key generation algorithm is, of course, responsible for, wait for it, generating keys. And in particular, a pair of keys, a public key and a secret key which are uh, intimately related. So the way I'm gonna sort of write this algorithm is I'm gonna think of it as taking as input a random seed, so just some random number plucked from the sky. And then in return as output, it gives you a pair of keys, a public key, which, you know, as the name would suggest, is meant to be broadcast to the world, and a secret key, which, as the name would suggest, you're meant to sort of keep secret and not tell anyone else. At all. And we'll see why in a second. Now, in practice, often the key generation algorithm actually takes nothing as input. It just generates its own random seed internally and then hands you on a silver platter uh, your public key secret key pair. Um, so, for example, you know, at a typical Unix command line, if you just type in SSH dash key gen with no arguments, uh, you'll get back a public key secret key pair. So this is just off the shelf technology available at the command line. So what can you do with a secret key? What can you do with a public key? Well, you can sign and verify respectively. So let's start by being precise about the signing algorithm. So the signing algorithm takes two inputs, right? So you need to know, it needs to know what you want to sign. Okay, so that's the message. You know, so that'd be like a document. 
Uh, and also it needs to know who's signing it. And the, the who here is specified by this secret key. So given a message to be signed and given a secret key with which to sign it, that signing algorithm produces the signature. Okay, so it hands you back the same message. The message is there in the clear, but tacked onto the end is a signature, okay, which is meant to authenticate the fact uh, that the owner of the secret key was in fact the one who signed that message. So signatures are really just kind of annotations on messages. They're just sort of a little bit extra added at the end. So a key point about this signing algorithm and about digital signatures in general is that the signature that you generate depends on the message that you want to sign. Okay? Notice both the message and the identity of the person are inputs to the signing algorithm, and its output, the signature, depends on both of those two inputs. And this is different right, than real life, than physical signatures. Right? If I'm signing a document physically with a pen, in, with a pen on paper, uh, my signature is independent of the contents of that document. Right? That's how signatures normally work. Now, in the digital realm, of course, that would never work, right? Because there'd be a simple copy and paste attack. If I wanted to pretend that I was you, all I need to do is go find one message that you had signed, and I would copy and paste your signature on any other message I want, making it look like you signed it, and really you had no intention of doing so. So to have any hope of working in the digital world, it's absolutely essential that the signature depends not just, of course, on the identity of the signer, but also on the content of the message being signed. Finally, we have the verification algorithm whose responsibility is to check whether or not an alleged signature actually is valid. Now, for a verification algorithm to carry out this task, uh, it's of course going to need to know the message in question. Uh, it of course needs to know the alleged signature that it's trying to check. And then it also needs to know, you know, who it is who supposedly generated this signature. And so, you know, in the signing algorithm, identity is indicated by the secret key. In the verification algorithm, it's going to be indicated by the corresponding public key. So these are the three inputs to the verification algorithm, the message uh, that's, that was supposedly signed, the supposed signature, and the identity of the person who supposedly signed it, identified by their public key. The output of the verification algorithm is just a simple yes or no. So it's supposed to say yes, if indeed someone possessing the secret key corresponding to the given public key would generate the given signature on the given message. That means the signature is authentic. It really was signed by the person who knows the secret key corresponding to the public key, or the algorithm report no if that's not the case. So if in fact signing this message with the corresponding secret key would generate a different signature than the one provided, then the verification algorithm will, will tell you no. So notice the secret key is used for signing, the public key is used for verification. Both the secret key and the public key are sort of identifying the same person, but the secret key is supposed to be known only to that person, which makes sense because we want only that person to be able to generate signatures. On the other hand, we'd like anybody to be able to verify the authenticity of our signatures. And so that's why we want the verification algorithm to need only the public key. And then, you know, if we publish the public key on the internet, it means anybody can verify using the verification algorithm any message that we send. So if you haven't encountered uh, previously digital signature schemes, it may seem kind of magical. And actually, to be honest, it still seems kind of magical to me. Um, but we've had construction of them, practical constructions, uh, since the late 1970s. Okay, so this is really just kind of off-the-shelf technology. I should say a little bit about what it means for a digital signature scheme to be secure. So in all of these lectures, we'll make a sort of extreme assumption. It's still a very close approximation to reality, but a sort of extreme assumption uh, that signatures are ideal. So for us, this is basically going to be assuming that forgeries are impossible. So the only way you could ever generate a signature on a message that would be verified by a given public key is if you actually knew the corresponding secret key. You couldn't like magically figure out what the signing algorithm would output if you didn't know what the secret key is. And so let me just write, don't know secret key implies impossible to generate a valid message plus sig. Here by valid, I mean something that would be accepted by the verification algorithm uh, if you fed in the public key uh, corresponding to this unknown secret. So this assumption of ideal signatures, it's a, it's, a, it's a close approximation of reality, at least if you use a properly implemented digital signature scheme and a sufficiently uh, long key length. Um, but as a theoretician, I do feel obliged to you know, point out that strictly speaking, this assumption is false. This is not satisfying, unless you make some mild extra assumptions. 
So why is it false? Well, I mean, in principle, I could brute force your secret key, for example. Okay, so what do I mean? Uh, so maybe I maybe I see one signature you did on one message. Okay, so there's some message where you signed it using the signing algorithm and using your secret key, and then I see the signature that was generated. I don't know your secret key though. Well, now I, again, I could brute force it. So I could just enumerate over every possible um, sort of string of bits that your secret key possibly could be. You know, I keep feeding it into the signing algorithm. At some point, the output of the signing algorithm will agree with the signature that I saw that you generated. At that point, I've guessed your secret key correctly. And now I can just use it to sign future messages uh, as if I was you without, without your permission. Okay, so in principle, it's not true that you can't forge messages without being explicitly told the secret key, but still, like, right, we're not worried about this brute force attack, right? I mean, as long as the key length is sufficiently long, like imagine it was a 512-bit key, say, right, then this brute force attack is going to have to enumerate through 2 to the 512 different possibilities, which is, you know, a, a ridiculous amount. It's more than the estimated number of atoms in the universe. So no one's ever going to be able to complete that, that computation. So in order to make this assumption uh, actually true, at the very least, we're going to have to bound the computational power of a potential attacker. We can be quite liberal. We can give it, you know, say, an arbitrarily large polynomial uh, number of operations here, polynomial in the length of the key. Uh, but the brute force attack takes an exponential number of tries. So polynomial computation is not going to be good enough to execute the brute force, uh, the brute force attack. All right, so this is an additional mild assumption that we need to make, right? That basically adversaries don't have infinite computing power. You know, they, they just have polynomially bounded computing. While we're on this topic, actually, I should mention that, you know, in a digital signature scheme, these three algorithms, you, of course, you know, want them to actually be efficient, right? So someone with a bounded amount of computational power should be able to carry out each of these three algorithms. Good, so I guess we're done, right? We just sort of, you know, say that uh, everybody has polynomially bounded computation, you know, which is a pretty modest assumption. Uh, and then we're done because, you know, that's not enough computation to pull off the brute force attack. Well, there is, there's another issue, right? Which is who said that, you know, an adversary can only resort to brute force search attacks. If an adversary had some very clever algorithm for reverse engineering a secret key without doing brute force search, it would certainly use that instead. And remember, if you've studied some computer science, you've seen lots of examples of computational problems where the obvious brute force search approach was unimplementable, took exponential time, but there was some super clever computational shortcut that solved it very quickly. Take like the shortest path problem, right? So like a network can have an exponential number of paths from the source to a destination, yet Dijkstra's algorithm somehow cleverly, you know, just sifts through the exponential, exponential number of possibilities in near linear time and completes the shortest path. So it strikes fear in our hearts is the prospect of there being a similar computational shortcut for, this com for the problem of reverse engineering a secret key, uh, having seen a number of messages signed with that secret key. And this is the reason why computational complexity assumptions sort of always enter the picture when you're talking about the security of cryptographic schemes. You have to somehow assume that there aren't, that these shortcut algorithms don't exist, you know, which fundamentally is a computational complexity assumption. Now, different digital signature schemes uh, make different complexity assumptions to justify their security. Uh, for the schemes that are most common in a blockchain context, what's important is the computational hardness of the discrete log, the discrete logarithm problem. Not important you know what that is if you haven't seen it before. You know, it's basically I give you a group element G raised to some exponent X, and you want to try to figure out what X was knowing only G to the X. Uh, and the uh, assumption is that there's no shortcut algorithm for that discrete log problem. What you can prove is that under that assumption, assuming there's no efficient algorithm for discrete log, in fact, there's no efficient algorithm for reverse engineering a secret key from a collection of messages that have been signed with that secret. Okay, so to review, we see we need to assume that the adversary has polynomially bounded computation. Uh, we see that we need to make complexity assumptions uh, to rule out any shortcut algorithm much faster than brute force search for reverse engineering a secret key. And actually, Technically, we need one more kind of assumption, which is we need to allow a, a potentially very small probability that the scheme is broken, right? Because, you know, even a polynomially bounded adversary, they can't do brute force search, but they could still guess a few times. They could write down a random number, uh, hope it's your secret key, you know, sign a message they saw you signed earlier if, 
their random guess fed into the signing algorithm happens to generate the same signature that you generated, the adversary is like, whoa, I just magically guessed uh, the secret key. And now I can just sort of forge messages uh, you know, from that person forevermore. Now, again, this is not something we're actually worried about because if the key length is decently long, you know, the probability that you would magically guess the secret key is, is exponentially small. It's just basically zero. But technically, it's non-zero. So summarizing, you know, now we understand the sense in which this sort of ideal signatures assumption, strictly speaking, is false. But this discussion also tells us exactly what the, um, how would we modify it uh, to make it a little bit weaker, but basically the same, but so that it would actually become true, right? So the formal statement, uh, the formal security statement for a digital signature scheme would then be under suitable complexity assumptions, like assuming that uh, there's no polynomial time algorithm for solving the discrete logarithm problem. Under that assumption, it would be the case that no polynomially bounded adversary, meaning the amount of computational time that they have, is at most polynomial in our key length. Under the complexity assumptions, uh, no poly polynomially bounded adversary would have more than a non-negligible probability of reverse engineering a secret key from a collection of messages that have been signed with that secret key. Okay, so that's going to be the formal security statement. We're not actually going to use that statement. Uh, we're going to just stick with the ideal signatures assumption uh, because it's a close approximation of reality and it simplifies our life in a lot of other respects. You know, but I did just you know, want to clear my conscience and let you know that this is false and also let you know what is the closely related version of the statement that's actually true. And as I said, uh, since the late 1970s, constructions have been known of digital signature schemes that do satisfy uh, this type of security guarantee. We're not going to talk at all about uh, how those schemes are constructed uh, in this lecture series, but I encourage you to look in a cryptography book or, or check out a cryptography MOOC, uh, which would explain exactly that, exactly what the construction is. Digital signature schemes are used all over the place in uh, a blockchain context. I mean, typical blockchain protocols involve a lot of communication between a bunch of nodes that don't necessarily trust each other. And so digital signatures are essential for sort of knowing the authenticity of a message, right? So for example, if I'm node A and some node B tries to convince me that, oh, you know, node C said this other thing earlier, right? I'm going to say like, well, show me node C's signature on that message. On that message. I'm not just going to believe you, node B, about what you say that node C said. Show me the signature and then I'll believe that node C said that message. And indeed, when we start talking about consensus protocols, beginning in lecture number two, um, you know, throughout this lecture series, unless I say otherwise, just by default, assume that every single message sent by some node A to some other node B is in fact signed by node A. Okay, so every message in one of our protocols is going to be by default signed by the sender. So that wraps up everything I wanted to say, at least for now, about cryptography and specifically digital signature schemes. So in the next video, we'll start introducing some of the vocabulary necessary to discuss the correctness of consensus protocols, specifically consistency and liveness. I'll see you there.